for this Friday evening from all of us here at News at 5.45 for the moment. Goodbye. That's a good start, isn't it? Hello and welcome to what promises to be one of the big sporting weekends of the year. And with a high at last dominating the weather front, we hope for a sunny start here on Day by Day. We'll be reflecting on the excitement of the world's greatest steeplechase, the Grand National, and meeting some of the contenders. We find out why it's always fair weather for the Basingstoke bike, designed and unveiled by schoolchildren today. My Friday night guest, Carol Drinkwater, who, following her success in All Creatures Great and Small, faces competition from a cast of 300, now assembling for Noel Coward's cavalcade. All this and Joan Collins, too. She dropped in on the army at Aldershot this afternoon. What more could you possibly want? But first, the regional news from Peter Clark. Peter? Reports are coming in of a serious fire at the Park Pruitt Psychiatric Hospital on the outskirts of Basingstoke in Southampton. In Hampshire, rather. The fire is in the main hall of the hospital and more than 50 firemen are there. A hospital administrator said a short while ago that they were confident no patients had been hurt. But firemen wearing breathing masks are searching the building to ensure that all patients and staff are safe. A hundred patients have been moved out from wards near the main hall onto the lawns outside. Flames and smoke can be seen coming from the building. The hospital has again said that all patients are indeed safe, but the fire is now reported to have a hold on the entire building and flames are now coming through the roof. A sex attacker who exercised what a judge described as a reign of terror in Dorset, Wiltshire and Hampshire was jailed for three years today. Christopher Lord, who's 28 and lives in Wimborne Road at Bournemouth, admitted six charges of indecent assault and asked for 24 other offences to be considered. Dock workers at Southampton have returned to work after hearing details of a peace formula agreed at talks yesterday. The men took the decision this morning at a mass meeting in Southampton Guild Hall and they're claiming it as a victory for the Transport Workers Union. The port authorities have agreed to pay the dockers for the three weeks they were locked out and there are to be more talks about their pay grievances. A spokesman for the docks board said the men had given an assurance that there'd be no more lightning strikes. Hundreds of staff walked out of income tax offices in Southampton today when three inspectors were suspended. It was the second stoppage in two days. Tax men in Poole and Bournemouth walked out in sympathy. The foot and mouth disease alert on the mainland should be lifted from most of Hampshire and Dorset at midnight on Sunday, as long as there are no new outbreaks. But the Agriculture Ministry say restrictions on animal movements will remain in force on some farms and the whole of the Isle of Wight until further notice. The alert began when the disease was confirmed at Hampstead Farm near Yarmouth 12 days ago. Since then, Ministry vets have slaughtered hundreds of cattle and pigs in the area to contain the outbreak. Keith Hatfield of ITN asked the Ministry's chief vet what made them confident that they'd succeeded. Well, we find we've been through all our tracings. We've done all the contacts that uh, were necessary. We haven't found any further disease in those tracings. We've done the patrol of the infected uh, two-mile infected area to see whether there's any disease there. We haven't found any there. The report cases are becoming less in number, fewer reports from the farmers of suspected disease. And hopefully, if this continues, we could uh, possibly um, be coming out, uh, coming out uh, reducing the infected area to the island uh, at midnight on Sunday. Another council in the south are considering handing over their dustbin service to private enterprise. 
Already it's happened in Southend. Now Fareham in Hampshire have asked the other firms to submit estimates for doing the job. Dustmen say they'll oppose such a move. A shop in Bournemouth lost most of its stock of clothes in a fire during the night. It took more than 30 firemen nearly an hour to put out the flames at the Alamode boutique in Bournemouth's old Christchurch Road. The ground floor and basement of the shop were badly damaged. It's believed that the fire started in the basement. The MP for Basingstoke is supporting the town council's record rent increases of 66%. Mr David Mitchell says that the likely effects of the increases have been exaggerated and he accused some tenants of supplying him with false information to support their case. The Greek captain of a freighter was fined £600 at Southampton Court today for allowing a dog to escape from his ship. The court was told he'd been warned to keep the dog securely aboard when the ship arrived from Italy. There was a rather unusual service at St Mark's Church in Bournemouth today when 19 children were baptised together. The children, who are aged between 5 and 11, attend the nearby St. Mark's Primary School in Talbot Road. They were not christened as babies and asked the school to arrange the ceremony. Because of the numbers involved, the vicar acquired a special portable font. Reverend William Rodder said it was the first time he'd heard of such a service in 50 years as a priest. And finally, from Brighton Crown Court, the story of a bungling bandit. As part of his disguise, he took off his glasses. But he was so short-sighted that he bumped into a car while making his getaway and was pounced upon by the staff of the jewellers he'd just robbed. Today he was sentenced to 240 hours of community service. That's it, Chris. Thank you, Peter. Travel economy has dictated a boom in two-wheel drive, and in particular the motorcycle. With that in mind, school children at Basingstoke have come up with a new concept in motorbike design. It's an idea they hope will win them a cup in a national competition on Sunday. Steve Harris has been to have a look at the Build-A-Bike collection. The schools taking part in the competition have been challenged by BP to produce a motorbike with all-weather protection. And of the 18 entries to reach the final stage, two come from the Cranbourne School here in Basingstoke. The first bike has been produced by a group of engineering and design students under the supervision of teacher Chris Burrows of the school's design department. The second is the work of just one 15-year-old pupil, Jeremy Rolfe, who's building his machine as part of an O-level design course. Apart from the engines, which were supplied free to the finalists, these two weatherproofed machines have been designed and built by the pupils in the school's extensively equipped workshops, and that's allowed them time to follow through their concept from drawing board to finished vehicle. Yeah. Well, uh, the boys that have been taking the course have been taking a metalwork course, a CSE metalwork course, and so in the, in the, the project we've been able to design through and they've been also able to weld and do bench fitting and really a good range of extra items to, the, to what they would have normally done in, a stri in the straightforward classroom situation. Do you think working towards a final object like this, a vehicle that really works, adds enthusiasm and interest to the yes, schoolwork? I, I, I think that's very true, yes. They feel that also having such a tight deadline as we have had, I think has pressured them into working extra hard on the project and coming in at break times, lunch times, after school and occasional days, holiday, when I've not been allowed to have a holiday, they've <laughs> wanted to come in. This morning the team were hard at work putting the finishing touches to the machine and fixing on the protective weather shield. For Jeremy Rolfe, who's been working on the project for six hours a day since last May, his goal is at last in sight. Jeremy, what do you think uh, you've learned from doing this project? Uh, what I want to do when I've left school and as a future career. Are you happy with the way things have gone or did you, do you think you've taken on more than you could possibly cope with? Well. It's been a bit dodgy at some times, whether we'd finish it or not, but it's gone all right. What's been the biggest problem for you? Uh, most probably the steering head, getting that milled out and fitted. And do you think it will work? Yes, it should do, will. Do you think it can win, though? That I'm not so sure of. Right, let's see if it works. Oh, 
I think our Steve has been watching too much Tiswas. We do wish the pupils of Cranbourne School the very best of luck on Sunday. Now, given good weather, no doubt many of you will be taking to the road this weekend to find the green popping through the trees, or perhaps you'll be working on your bulbs in the garden. But if you're stuck for an idea, James Montgomery may have the answer as he goes round and about the south this weekend. Hello there. Many outdoor events are cancelled again this weekend because of the foot and mouth outbreak, so do please check on those pointer points, gymkhanas, even clay pigeon shoots and so on. Your journey could just be wasted. However, the doggies will be strutting proudly on Sunday at the Crofton Community Centre in Stubbington at 1.45, at Chaley Heritage Craft School in Sussex from 12.30 also on Sunday, and at Shripney Manor Fields near Bognor Regis tomorrow at 1.00. Nicholas Parsons, of all people, will be diving into the waters of the Central Pool Battle Street Reading tomorrow evening at 6 for a sponsored swim. We are assured this will be the fun-packed swim of the century. And more fun on the water on the Basingstoke Canal at Reading Road Bridge at Fleet. The popular and colourful canoe tourist trial will begin at 9 on Sunday morning and continue all day. It's open to all, novice and expert, and attracts canoeists of all ages from 8 to 70. And the Shirley Sea Angling Club's fishing festival is on Sunday from 10 till 4, with fishing from the Western Shore to Hamble Common, signing on at the Western Shore only. Hampshire drivers beware. The great sponsored bed push between Alton and Aldershot is tomorrow, starting in Alton at 9. And those of you heavily into bodybuilding might take a peep at the Grand Physique Show at Salisbury's College of Technology tomorrow evening at 7 o'clock. Now then, here are just some of the plays and musicals all tomorrow. You can see the thriller farce, Wanted One Body, by the Whitchurch Dramatic Society in Whitchurch Parish Hall at 7.30. The castle players star in the comedy Lord Arthur Savile's Crime in Lichard Matravers Village Hall at 7.45. The Winchester Dramatic Society presents Saturday, Sunday, Monday at the Chesil Theatre in Winchester at 7.30, and all next week. Up to Wallingford in Oxfordshire for the Synodon Players' production of Rashomon in the Corn Exchange at 7.45. And the Pebbles Theatre Company are in the musical comedy All at Sea in the Garden Arts Centre in Brighton, both tomorrow and Sunday at 8.15. With Easter approaching, I'm afraid there are just too many fairs, bazaars and horticultural shows to mention. But of course, in the music world, the magnificent Bach St Matthew Passion is very much in season, with performances in Salisbury Cathedral tomorrow at 7.30 and in Portsmouth Cathedral on Sunday at 5.00. Other concerts tomorrow include Carmen Birana at Carisbrook High School on the Isle of Wight at 7.45, the Lavant Music Hall's annual show in the Memorial Hall at 7.30, Salvation Army concerts in both Wimborne Minster at 7.30 and Canada Grove Bognor Regis at 7, and chamber music at St Mary's Church Shoreham at 7.30. Some exhibitions that might intrigue you now at Otall School Haywards Heath, Leisure 81 tomorrow afternoon, has on show all kinds of leisure time activities. A remarkable needlework exhibition is in the Tithe Barn, Hinton St Mary in Dorset, tomorrow and Sunday from 2 until 6. And wood sculptures by the late great Ron Lane are on show at Queen Elizabeth Country Park near Petersfield tomorrow and Sunday from 10. In sharp contrast, there are three banger racing meetings this Sunday at Chestnut Avenue Eastleigh at 2, Matchams Park Ringwood at 3 and Burstow Lodge Farm at Smallfield near Hawley and Sussex at 12.30. And finally, young couples in the Hampshire area about to take the plunge just might benefit from the wedding fair being staged at the Potter's Heron near Romsey on Sunday from 12 till 8. Bridal fashion shows, flowers, photography, even horse-drawn carriages could well influence the style in which you choose to embark on married life. And with that, it's back to Christopher. And cue the Lady Diana lookalikes. Now, the army has always been fond of cheesecake. Nothing's done more to boost the troops' morale than the pin-up. Today, the professionals turned out in force to welcome Joan Collins. Miss Collins, who was recently voted one of the world's sexiest women, kept to date with men of the 6th Field Force Headquarters and Signal Squadron. Her appearance in the famous Rushmore Arena at Aldershot was the climax to their fourth birthday celebrations. Joan Collins, who put the X certificate in the British film industry with movies like The Stud and The Bitch, was voted a knockout by the army in a red silk suit. And for a handful of fans in the crowd, it was a day they will long remember, as Miss Collins obliged with her autograph. And then she focused her attention on the first public performance of 1981 by the White Helmet motorcycle display team. Miss Collins, who's used to taking her clothes off in the cinema, put on a fur coat to guard against a chilly wind. But it did nothing to deter the affection of the army, who got all fired up for a military spectacular. And we'll be back putting on the style in part two.
they so excited about? Well, instead of the usual Sunday joint, they're having butterball turkey. Yeah, but it's got no bones. No wonder he's carving so well. At least he appreciates a good stuffing inside him. Oh, perhaps. But fancy getting het up over a stuffed bird. Ah! New deliciously juicy butterball turkey roast. A turkey with the joint personality. These are some of the world's toughest houses, battered by the worst weather there is. They're painted with Sanitex, because it's stronger than the forces it's up against. These houses can't afford to use anything less than Sanitex. Can you? Nature created its own garden in the sun. You know it as the Cape. The Cape of good quality. The same top quality apples, grapes and pears you've come to expect from Cape. Always pick Cape. It's fresh from the sun. This is an assault course for cooking foils. Ordinary ones don't last long here. That's why they're using new Baco foil. Because Baco foil has been made tougher. Even tougher than it was before. New Baco foil. Now even tougher. These cozy bits of nappies with elasticated legs seem made not to leak. They're elastic. These cozy bits are cozy, so cozy, cozy, cozy. They shoot and not leak. They're fantastic. In cozy bits are happy. The elasticated nappy may not to leak. They're elastic. In cozy bits are happy. The elasticated nappy may not to leak. They're fantastic. Sunshine in January. It always seems like a miracle, but only one horrendous snag. When it's after eight in Sussex, here it's just a shade after 12. <laughs> so we just pretend lunch is dinner and nobody seems to mind. And afterwards, black coffee and after eight mints, deliciously crisp and cool. As Charles says, times may change, but standards must be maintained. Those too young to understand, cheesecake simply means a pin-up. Now then, Cavalcade by Noel Coward has been described as a play for a crisis. It's a work that trumpets the virtues of being British with a host of patriotic songs. So perhaps it's no coincidence in these shaky times that the show should be making a comeback. Back in 1931, Noel Coward first staged his spectacular musical Cavalcade. It appeared at a time of depression with mass unemployment and soup kitchens. Coward rode cavalcade to put the heart back into Britain. Now, 50 years later, at a time again of massive unemployment, this spectacle is being revived at the Redgrave Theatre in Farnham, with a cast running into hundreds. Blue, God in the sky, why shouldn't he grin? High above this city. And with me now, one of the stars of Cavalcade, Miss Carol Drinkwater. Carol, why has it taken 50 years to revive Cavalcade? Well, after the original production, Noel Coward put an embargo on it because it needs hydraulic lifts and 300 extras and all that. And he said it could only be done if it was going to be done again at Drury Lane, which no one could afford to stage, so it wasn't done. It was, in fact, done uh, about ten years ago by a uh, drama school, and Noel Coward went to see it. It was just before he died. And a friend of mine was in it. Noel Coward talked to him, and he said, Oh, yes, in the original production, dear boy, I used to come on at the top of the double-decker bus, and the second half was double-decker bus, and I'd sit on the top and I'd count the house. Yes, which I thought was lovely, typical that's Coward really, dialogue. Yes, yes. You and I, of course, went around when, when it was first produced at Drury yes, Lane. Not. <laughs> right. We are told critics and public alike went wild. Now you've read it and seen the score, do you know what all the fuss is about with Cavalcade? I think it's a wonderful piece. I think it's a wonderful piece. The music, I mean, the things like Goodbye Dolly Gray, um, Goodbye, it goes from New Year's Eve 
1899 to New Year's Eve 1929. So it spans the lives of a few people, English people, over those 30 years through the First World War, um, on the beach in the Edwardian times, armistice, through the 20s, and it takes the music of that era. It goes you there's music even, throughout the whole you thing. You even recreate the, the sinking of the Titanic. We don't recreate that in our, in our production. It was done in the original. There, there is a scene about the, about the sinking yes. of the Titanic, but it's done in a slightly different way in our production. Now, what about these extras? Cast of 300. <laughs> what about them? We've got a picture. I must say, rehearsals look just like a bear garden, a cattle market. They are like a cattle you, market. You, you've already been along to one. What, yes, what's it like yes. then? Well, I think, I think David Horlock, who's directing it, has done the same thing that Noel Coward did. He has a whistle. <laughs> and I mean, he says, right, everybody, now this is the London scene when everyone's singing, you know, down at the Rose and Crown, and everybody's singing. The volume and the, the energy in the room, I mean, literally hit me against the wall when I first went in there. And when David wants them to stop, he blows a whistle. Mm. And there's 120 children in, in it, and um, there are two sets of 60. And for the scenes that I have to work with children, actual acting scenes, there are three sets of children. So every, every time I rehearse those scenes, we have to do it three different ways for different children. And so equity, I think, have given the um, special cast a special dispensation to, to work right? with amateurs, yes. which, of course, is theatrical history. It's never been done in England before, except in something like the York Mystery Plays, which is different. Do you think that every one of those 300 cast are going to get to the right place at the right time for the right cue oh on the God, right I night, Oh, God, I hope Carol? so. <laughs> I sincerely hope so. I mean, at the moment, because we haven't actually put the whole thing together. We've been rehearsing yes. separately from it's them. It's pieces of a jigsaw at the moment, isn't it? At the moment, is it? This is the weekend that we put it together. And how this are you feeling? Well, you I've, I've the booked into the hotel just round the corner, and I'm going to stay there, and I shall say, call me, ask me at my hotel if you want me, <laughs> if things get hairy. I think it will be... I think it's going to be wonderful. I'm very, very excited about it. Counting ought to have a great opening night, as they say. Thank you. And Cavalcade opens next week at the Redgrave Theatre at Farnham and plays for four weeks. Tomorrow, as if you didn't know, is Grand National Day, the greatest steeplechase in the world with a purse of £50,000 riding on the winner. The South is represented with some fancied entries, but tonight we turn our attention to a couple of outsiders. You know what I mean, the ones who come up from nowhere and provide a heart-stopping finish. With a special Eve of Race preview, David Bobin. Well, John Tyrrell stands by his selection for Josh Gifford's Alden 80, and both Senator McLeary and Sebastian V still look very good each-way value. But there is another horse trained right here in the south that represents even better value if his latest price of 100 to 1 is anything to go by. No Gypsy is trained at Woodgate near Bognor Regis by John Bridger. It's the second time that the horse has run in the National. In 1979 he was going well when balked by another horse at the 22nd. Although only 16 hands high, he's a neat jumper and in the skillful hands of John Southern could be a good bet to get round safely even if he's not in the first three. His companion on the long trip north today is a little pony owned by the bridge's daughter, Rachel. And Apache the Pony is a great help to know Gypsy, settling down in strange surroundings. A little pony, sort of a, just a little thing that's always around the yard. He's, he knows him and uh, he won't feel so lonely, I think. Do you think it'll help him to settle down once he gets there, to have a sort of familiar face in strange surroundings? I actually think it'll help him, you know, because it's home from home, perhaps. Really. The excitement that goes on here, I think. <laughs> I'd like to talk about the race in just a moment, but let's bring Eddie, Eddie Treacy in now, the, the owner. Um, Eddie, how good do you think his chances are? The bookies obviously don't think they're very good because he's, what, 100 to 1? Well, I think he's got a chance like everything else he's got there. And you know, it'd be nice for him to come home, finish it, you know. Anything other than that is a bit of glory. You're going to be out there actually watching the race? Yes, I shall be there. Do you think he is going to complete the circuit? Well, we keep our fingers crossed. He's got a good, a good chance of getting round because he's very, very safe. He stays forever. Um, but it's just one of those races where, you know, what's going to bring him down or what's... If he falls down, you know, you know, if he falls at the fence, it's just one of those things. But I don't think he'll fall through, through jump, faults of his own. He always seems to get another leg, you know. Well, he's not a very big horse, is he? No, he's quite small. But he's very clever. Well, is that going to be good, uh, in, his favor, in his favour at uh, favor. Daintree? Because he's used to going in and having to jump him rather than stand off a mile and you know, hitting something, or even when he's been racing before, he's had a few bumps and pushes. It's very, very clever, he gets out of trouble. He's going to be ridden in the race by John Southern. What are you going to tell John about the sort of race he ought to ride? Well, I think he better tell me, because he's ridden it before three times, and uh, he's ridden the horse, you know, he knows the horse backwards. 
Um, he's won twice on him this year, and he's won twice before him. So um, he really knows the horse backwards. He's, he's got it all planned out that he should go off on the outside. Uh, but if 40 other horses decide to do the same thing, it'll be a funny sort of a race. <laughs> right, Eddie, are you going to be backing him? No, oh, we shall have a little punt on him, yes. When you say a little punt, what do you mean by that? <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, what can you say? <laughs> a few pounds. <laughs> yeah, a few pounds. And for anybody watching tonight, do you think that uh, perhaps they might have a little flutter on No Gypsy? Well, as I said, he's got as good a chance as anything in there on the day, I think. All right, final word from the trainer. Would you go along with that? I mean, is, oh, yeah. is he an investment? So, yeah, it's a good, good investment at the price, 100 to 1. I don't think he'd be 100 to 1 when they start, but he's 100 to 1 now, and um, he's always managed it before, so, he, you know, he's been lucky for me anyway. Well, if you have some sort of luck and finish in the first four, it'll be a great oh, journey home. Yeah, that'll be out. That'll be the gravy. <laughs> Incidentally, news today that Hambledon jockey Bill Smith, who originally didn't have a national horse, gets the ride on Coolishall after Broadman Row Wilson took a heavy fall at Aintree yesterday. And don't forget also our other national outsider, Martinstown, trained down at Cranbourne by permit holder Meter Easton. Martinstown left for Aintree yesterday, current odds 40 to 1, and Malcolm Batters, all six foot three of him in the saddle. But there is still, of course, a full programme of other sport tomorrow, and football predictably grabs the headlines. Nowhere is there a game more important than at the Dell, as Southampton and Nottingham Forest fight it out as they both bid for a place in Europe. Southampton manager Laurie McMenemy has not yet named a team, but it'll be the same squad that travelled to Aston Villa last week. Brighton will be unchanged, and despite slight injury doubts, Mark Lawrenson looks certain to play, and the Albion will need him if they, as they face Arsenal at the Goldstone in their battle against relegation. The Portsmouth manager, Frank Burrows, has promised drastic action for the game at Carlisle. Stuart Croft replaces the suspended Steve Azelwood to make his Pompey debut. And both Keith Viney and Peter Ellis are dropped from the defence to be replaced by Steve Bryant and Alan Garner. Alan Rogers returns after injury in place of Neil Ayrton. Meanwhile, Reading travel to Exeter, whilst in Division 4, Aldershot are at home to Bradford City, and Bournemouth, they'll be unchanged for the visit of Wigan. Well, finally, Athletics and Brighton's Steve Ovette, the Olympic 800 metres champion, has left the Brighton and Hove Athletic Club, and he's now part of a new club in the town. He left Brighton and Hove two weeks ago to join the new setup, which is to be called Phoenix, and has been registered with the Southern Counties 3As. It's believed Ovette was not happy with the way that children were encouraged at his old club. Well, that's it. Have a good weekend. Now here's Chris. Thank you, David. It's not just Grand National Day tomorrow, it's also Day by Day's birthday. We're 20 years old, and we'd like to thank all of you who very kindly sent us cards and telegrams. Wouldn't we, Trevor? Well, we certainly would, though I wasn't here 20 years ago, 18 years ago. You don't look a day over it anyway, Trevor, so don't worry. And the weather's going to be pretty good this weekend uh, for a change, a nice weekend ahead of us. It's going to be dry, and there's going to be some sunshine too. We have a nice high-pressure area centred over Scotland, and that's going to keep the weather dry over most of the British Isles, not only the south of it. We've had a lot of cloud coming in on these northeasterly winds today, but it has been breaking up away from the uh, east coast. If you're interested in continental weather, it's pretty good all the way from the Mediterranean north to Germany, with temperatures rather higher than we're having in Britain at the moment, somewhere between 15 and 20 degrees centigrade in most places, with the exception of Holland and Belgium and the extreme northeast of France, where temperatures are rather low and it's pretty cloudy. Right, the forecast chart for noon tomorrow, and still a high around. There'll be some cloudy weather with occasional rain northwest Scotland. And it'll be cloudy in eastern districts of England too near the east coast, but apart from that, it'll be dry and most places will get a fair amount of sunshine. Sea crossing, slightly choppy tonight, tomorrow and Sunday. Tonight in the south, it'll be dry and cloudy and the lowest temperatures will be five degrees centigrade and there won't be any frost. Tomorrow will begin cloudy, but during the day, it'll, the cloud will break up and there'll be sunshine at times in all parts, but I can't tell you the duration of, your sun, of the sunshine in your particular area. It'll ra be rather variable. Temperatures will get up to about 13 degrees centigrade and needless to say, it'll be a dry day tomorrow. Winds are going to be northeasterly, light or moderate over land, and force three to five over the sea. So quite good winds for sailing tomorrow. So that's the forecast. Similar conditions on Sunday. I'll get through as many wedding names as I can. Angela and Alan, Patsy and Malcolm, Janet and Les, Alison and Barry, Michaela and Chris, Joanna and Martin, Anna and Neil, Julie and Nigel, Sarah and Derek, and Rhonda and George. For you and all the others, pleasant weather. That's all. Not a pleasant news story to end on, I'm afraid. The latest on that fire we mentioned in the news at Park Pruitt Psychiatric Hospital at Basingstoke. Smoke can now be seen for several miles. The fire has ripped through the roof of the hospital's main hall. Firemen are still trying to control the flames. Earlier, the hospital authorities had said that all patients were evacuated safely. But we've since heard that a woman patient has died of a heart attack.
thought to have been caused by the commotion, and police have appealed for relatives of other patients not to visit the hospital. Until Monday from all of us, good night. Friday night programs from Southern. Survival at 6.30 shows the Mustang, the American wild horse. Then at 7 o'clock, Family Fortune is...